This morning we continue the series of talks. I think most people uh, will probably remember that we're doing, I have been doing a series of talks on the Noble Eightfold Path. And uh, the Noble Eightfold Path is a path, the Buddha said, that leads in one direction and it leads to enlightenment. It leads to freedom from suf all suffering, all, uh, all defilement. It leads to purity of the mind. And today the the, uh, the uh, do people remember where we're up to? Which one? This, this one? Yes, we finished effort, so it's mindfulness today. It's called right mindfulness, and I've subtitled it "Giving Us Choice." Right mindfulness, giving us choice. But first of all, I'll just give a quotation. I like to start the, the, each talk with a quotation from the Buddha about the Noble Eightfold Path. This one I found in the suttas. I really like it, actually. I may read the rest of it next week, actually. And this is uh, talking about the Noble Eightfold Path. The Buddha said, This divine vehicle, unsurpassed, originates from within oneself. The wise depart from the world in it, inevitably winning the victory. So that's very nice, isn't it? So it's a lovely, sort of like a divine vehicle. Maybe the Mercedes or <laughs> the Audi or whatever, BMW. So, so the this is the seventh factor. This is uh, I use the symbol of a wheel. You might remember the wheel with eight spokes. And this is a very traditional uh, symbol of the uh, the Dhamma, the wheel of Dhamma. And this, of course, is the seventh spoke. And uh, uh, I always say always add at the beginning of this, why is it right mindfulness, why is it right view and so on, I always say it's right for attaining enlightenment, right for attaining awakening, that's the point. There are many other things we can do in terms of mindfulness that may not lead to enlightenment, may not lead to awakening, therefore they won't be right for that. So that's a good thing to keep in mind. And also the, the symbol of the wheel gives us the idea, doesn't it, that all the spokes are necessary. If you start taking out some of the spokes, the wheel will probably collapse or certainly will warp very quickly. It won't be usable. So they're all very important and they support each other. And mindfulness, the samasati as they call it in the, the Pali language, is very, very much supports all the other factors too because we need mindfulness, for instance, to keep the precepts. We need mindfulness or what we call right action, right speech and right livelihood. We need it for that. We need it for right attitude, to know what's going on in the mind. And we need it for uh, right effort too, to know what is occurring in the mind, whether it's wholesome or unwholesome, and what to do about it. And it's also very useful for right view too, because we start to see the connections between things. When we have mindfulness, we know what's going on in this body and in this mind. And therefore, we can get an understanding, we can look at it and get an understanding, particularly of cause and effect, of the conditioning factors that are giving rise to our present experience. And this is a great, uh, a great uh, insight that we need uh, for breaking through to the Dhamma and seeing through the, the, the biggest suffering in all our lives, and people would debate this, I think, the sense of self, which we, we think is doing everything, is running the show, which is actually causing us most of the problems, most of the troubles, and most of the suffering. So I was going to, uh, first of all, ask, what is mindfulness? I think these days you hardly need to ask, but <laughs> most people seem to. Mindfulness is everywhere, and you know you hear of it particularly in psychology, psychiatry, in education. There are probably uh, nearly every field that mindfulness is now considered to be a vital part of it. And... Uh, I have even seen, I remember last year when I was here, I saw a catalogue for, a Christmas catalogue, and it was talking about mindful toys. So, <laughs> so these are toys, I think most toys are pretty mindful. Kids, when they pick them up, they're very much present with it, and they certainly know what to do with it. So, so the world has really discovered mindfulness in a big way and uh, finding it very useful, particularly the aspect, isn't it, of mindfulness that's present with experience, whatever we're experiencing. Mindfulness that's free of the past and the future. And of course, when it's like that, what happens? What happens to the experience of the present moment? The thinking, the thinking is greatly reduced. The, 
because a lot of that comes from the past, what we did, how we should have done it better or what they said or what she said or what they did and planning about the future, either looking forward to it or having anxiety about it, how will I cope, how will I manage. And all this thinking, when we're very present, you notice the present moment is quite simple and straightforward and it doesn't have a lot of thinking, a lot of thinking is not required. So this is very useful for us because it gives us a bit of relief from the thinking, which is actually one of the major torturers uh, for people's minds. But of course, you know, when we have mindfulness in psychology, when we have it in education, when we have mindful toys and so on, this is very much keeping us in the present moment and reducing that thinking, reducing the habit patterns we have for sure. But will it lead to enlightenment? <laughs> of course, without that sort of uh, without that sort of right view, without that perspective that the Buddha gave us of how to reach enlightenment. Of course, mindfulness by itself cannot take us to enlightenment. We have to know how to look, what we're looking, when we see our experience in the present, we have to know how to look at it and how to investigate it. And that will take us to enlightenment. But I always say, you know, because some people say, oh, how can they take mindfulness out of Buddhism and <laughs> that sort of thing. But I think no matter, it brings great benefit and also I always feel that if people find benefit in something, they want to find it, usually they'll want to find out more and they'll follow up and they'll say, oh, there's more than just mindfulness and this right view and this uh, right attitude or right intention, right motivation they call it, and right action, right speech, right livelihood, right effort, of course right mindfulness and then right samadhi. And that's not actually the end of the path itself either. So I think if people start with mindfulness, whatever the setting that they find it, they uh, discover it and find it useful, they will, they will continue with it and maybe then develop the rest of the path. The Buddha said, of course, that for, for enlightenment, we need the eightfold noble path. And it's not a onefold noble path. As uh, someone was telling me just the other day, they were talking to one of the, one of the early members, she wasn't actually a founder, Elizabeth Bell, and they were no doubt, it sounded like this person was saying to them, oh, meditation, that's a real practice, you know, mindfulness is a real practice, and Satipatthana is a real practice. And, and evidently she just said to him, well, he said to this person, it's not a one-fold path. <laughs> it's an it's eight-fold path. And for a very good reason, that it's got to be the whole of our lives. It covers the whole of our lives, whole of our experience of body and mind, not only in meditation, in daily life as well, you know, at home and at work. It has to be include all those aspects. If we just have mindfulness and we don't have the ethical side of uh, the path, you know, our behaviour of body and speech, then, you know, uh, how is the meditation going to develop? And uh, if we don't have the right view, you know, what's it for? You know, where are we heading? If you don't have the map, then it's very difficult to, uh, to develop the path to awakening, to the goal that the Buddha had in mind. But nevertheless, it is, is a very wonderful thing that people get uh, benefit from mindfulness here and now. I think that's wonderful because it's, a, it's a, a great asset that the Buddha taught and for, for our happiness and well-being. So right mindfulness uh, is, it's actually, uh, most people here probably know Satipatthana. It's called actually, Satipatthana is right mindfulness. Um, right, the Satipatthana, of course, is... Uh, a mixture of sati and upatana, uh, which means sati, of course, is like we've used this word mindfulness, it's the English word mindfulness, and upatana is like establishments or applications, or Ajahn Brahm uses focuses for the mind. So this is, this is the meaning of uh, satipatthana. And of course, it's, uh, it's available in a number of places in the Buddhist text. It's available in the middle length discourses, and it's also available in the, uh, the long discourses of the Buddha. And there's also a whole chapter of short suttas about the uh, mindfulness, uh, Sati, uh, Satipatthana, in the uh, con connected discourses of the Buddha. So I always encourage people to read those, read them for yourself. And I will read some uh, sections from them so they give you an idea. I'll read Ajahn Brahm's um, 
translations of them because they're a little bit different actually and they're very meaningful actually and come from practice. And as I said, you know, the, the interesting thing with, with sati or uh, mindfulness, this is a word that was coined uh, by some of the first translators, I think it was uh, David, uh, uh, yes, one of the first translators, and it's, it's mindfulness, mindfully present, mindfully with what one's experiencing, full awareness. I've seen some funny cartoons on the internet where it's mindful, you can see a picture of a person with lots of thinking and everything, but this is mindful of the present moment, what one's experiencing, not full of the usual stuff, you know, all the, the memories and the, the plans and what they've just seen on the internet, the videos, everything, all that sort of stuff. But uh, one of the important meanings, and actually in, in a sense a very primary meaning of mindfulness, is memory. Most people, I think, what would you think of as a first meaning? What most people here would think of as a first meaning? Being present? I think that's what most people would, would think of, mindfulness as being in the present moment. But actually one of the, the core meanings, uh, perhaps the initial meaning, is memory. And it's very interesting, it's borne out by this, is uh, the fact that uh, the Buddha mentioned that his uh, attendant, Venerable Ananda, he was the foremost in sati, foremost in mindfulness. Why is that? I think most people will know. You could remember a phenomenal amount of the teachings, in fact nearly all the teachings that the Buddha gave, and nearly all the teachings we have recorded were remembered by him. One person remembering, amazing. So this sense of memory is actually very, uh, is essential because when we remember what we're supposed to be doing, what we, when we remember, you know, we're, say for instance, in the present moment, we have to remember that, we, that we've got to, we're, we're planning to be in the present moment. We keep that memory in mind. When we go to the breath, we remember, ah, it's the breath I'm keeping in mind. I like this idea of keeping in mind. It's uh, one of the Thai monks, uh, Ajahn Lee Damodaro used, is keeping the breath in mind. And it's remembering it. So memory is a very uh, core part of mindfulness. And the other day, someone told me that in Myanmar, in Burma, there are still six or seven monks who remember the whole of the Buddha's teaching by, my, by heart. That's phenomenal, isn't it? That's incredible memory. Amazing. And of course, originally, the, the purpose of that, the reason for that, well, people say, well, why'd they write them down? <laughs> Initially, they didn't write the teachings down, and it was some hundred years, few hundred years later that, that they wrote them down. And the way people remembered the teachings was just from, from by heart, by heart. But usually, in those days, at the time of the Buddha even, various sections of monks took responsibility for remembering diff different parts of the Buddha's teaching. Not, they didn't remember necessarily the whole of the Buddha's teaching and by that way they, they uh, collectively they would have the teachings, all the teachings. But of course, the essential, another essential quality of, mind, of sati, of mindfulness as we, we just said, we're just talking about is being present, knowing what we're experiencing in the present moment is a very important part of being mindful and being aware paying attention. And what are we, we aware of? What are we mindful of? Body, our body and mind. This is what, where the attention is. Uh, very often, with, uh, because of you know, all the, our interest in the sense pleasure, sense contact, seeing, hearing, smelling and tasting and touching, we're interested in other people's bodies, <laughs> other things. Every, things we see, hear, smell, taste and touch. So the awareness uh, is it's, uh, going out. But where we need to focus awareness, of course, for our own happiness and well-being is on this body and this mind. And uh, as I say, we need to remember also to keep the instructions in mind uh, for what to do with this experience of the present moment. There is a really... Uh, as often is the case, striking simile, striking simile that the Buddha gives, which is uh, <laughs> really, really a powerful way of, uh, of uh, illustrating this, the quality of mindfulness being remembering what we're doing, uh, uh, what we're doing in the present moment, and also being present, being aware in the present moment. And this is a, a, a simile he gave where 
there was an entertainer, a beautiful entertainer had come to a village. Often they say the most beautiful woman in the country. And she was a, a dancer and a singer. And she was set up in the, the main street on this village and is doing, uh, giving a performance, singing and dancing. And as she is singing, more people are coming and a big crowd gathers around uh, this uh, entertainer, this performer. But then there is a man who has got a big bowl of oil that's full to the brim, right to the brim. And he, he's been told that he has to go through this crowd of people and if he spills a drop of oil, there's a man coming behind, a person coming behind with a sword and he'll cut his head off if he spills a drop of oil. And then he has to go through the crowd, past this, this crowd that's watching the dancer and the singer, watching this performer singing and dancing. And he's got to pay attention. And he goes through, he's got to go through there and he has to, he said, this, the Buddha said, this is a type of mindfulness we, we need. He's using a very extreme simile. He was very good at these extreme similes because you will remember that. And so he goes through the crowd and will he drop, the Buddha says, will he spill a drop of oil knowing that, you know, his life is on the line. That if he does, then his head will be cut off. And then he says, of course, monks, this is the way we should develop uh, mindfulness. So it really combines, you can see two things there, the, the two meanings, are, hopefully you can see the two things that I'm emphasising, <laughs> that he has to have the awareness of what's going on in the present moment, otherwise he won't be able to make it through the crowd. But he also needs, there's a few things going on here, but he also needs to remember, if I do spill the oil, I, my head will be cut off. And there's a third thing that's there too, he has to remember to not be too not to go out to what he's hearing and seeing, you know, not to get, get caught up in the performance. And this brings, brings another, uh, another dimension to it because, of course, all the things outside ourselves, the sights, you know, TV, the internet, the videos, the music, the things we hear, the food we eat and smells uh, and touches, all these things take us out. They take the attention away and we're not aware, we're not... We're not present in a sense. We're just caught up in these, these things. But if you were going to have your head cut off, <laughs> you, probably, you probably would be pretty present, actually. you think, wow. Be very, I don't know about you. I'd be a bit nervous, too. <laughs> I think. But uh, it's also, as I, I was going to mention, too, that often you don't hear this, uh, this, uh, this teaching on the present moment. Is that, see, it's very key to a lot of meditation practice and it's uh, some verses the, the Buddha spoke about an, a single excellent night. And I think it's good to men mention this here because he's emphasizing the importance of the present moment. And actually when he, dis when he explains these verses, you, you understand that he's bringing together both meanings of it, awareness in the present but an understanding of what one's experiencing as well. So, I think many people know these, is often chanted in Pali actually. Let not a person revive the past or on the future build his hopes or her hopes. For the past has been left behind and the future has not been reached. Instead, with insight, let him or her see each presently arisen state. Let him know that and be sure of it, invincibly, unshakably, and then the arousing uh, verse part of it. Today the effort must be made. Tomorrow death may come, who knows? No bargain with mortality can keep him and his hordes away. But one who dwells thus ardently, relentlessly, by day, by night, it is he, the peaceful sage has said, who has had a single excellent night. So that's that, that gives you an idea of the importance of the present moment, definitely. Presently arisen states, the Buddha's talking about the presently arisen states. But um, what he is, uh, you might not gather from this, but from his explanation, it's very obvious that he's, he's talking about that one sees that in the, the experience of the present moment, there isn't uh, a self, a me, a mind and an I uh, in, in the mind or the body. And this is what he says that, uh, that he knows invincibly and unshakably. This is what he's talking about. So we have the sense, don't we have the point that I'm making is it's the present moment. For sure, you have to know. If we don't know what's going on in the present moment, 
how can we get any insight? <laughs> we don't have the facts, we don't have the information. It's not possible to develop insight. If we're in the past or in the future, if we've got very good, you know, if we're good understanding, intellectual understanding of the teachings and so on, that is not direct experience, is it? That's not knowing what's happening in the present. And what, uh, what's happening in the present relates to our experience, which is the important thing. And of course, people always ask, I think, uh, with, with all these sorts of teachings, what's it for? That's what I always ask, what's it for? And then I'll quote, because uh, this is quite nice, from a uh, uh, translation by uh, Ajahn Brahm <clears throat> on the opening, opening to the Four Focuses of Mindfulness, as he calls it, Satipatthana Sutta. And this is from the Middle Length Discourses. And he says, uh, this is the Buddha speaking, the four focuses of mindfulness lead in one direction only, to the purification of beings, to going beyond sadness and crying, to the disappearance of physical and mental suffering, for the attainment of the true way, for the realization of Nibbana. And then he says, what for? So this is, this is, uh, this is one. This is a quotation you often hear when you have talks on, on samasati, on right, right mindfulness. That it's for it leads in one direction only. This is controversial. It used to be said oh, it's the only path, but uh, many many um, scholars now point out that that's perhaps not the uh, correct translation, and that it leads in one direction. Certainly, other suttas have that meaning that uh, it's a path that leads in one direction. And it's a purification of being, so it removes greed, hatred and delusion. This is the aim of the path. This is the aim of enlightenment, isn't it? Fully enlightened person, no greed, no hatred, no delusion. How rare, what a wonderful gift <laughs> to the world. And it goes beyond sadness and crying. And it leads to the disappearance of physical and mental suffering. So this is all. Are we okay? All right, so now we can start again. So that was a very dramatic, dramatic, dramatic uh, 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 happening. At the, then somebody was very, it was sick, and it sounds like it was probably something to do with sugar hyperglycemia um, attack. So, but that sort of illustrates the the point in many ways of being a, of a, a sati of mindfulness, isn't it? We were present here. We we knew what was happening, or especially the doctor knew what was happening, and also was remembering what to do and had the, had that in mind as well. So those two two things vital, and uh, now that uh, person he's having a rest, uh, having a lie down, and recovering hopefully from that. So that was a fairly dramatic <laughs> interlude. And as I say, the uh, four focuses of mindfulness lead to the end of physical and mental suffering. I was just saying that when, when, he, when, he, was, uh, when he had the, uh, that attack. And for the attainment of the true way and the realization of Nibbana. So, and I'll go into how we do it later. So it's realizing um, th through understanding directly the, the truth of our own bodies and minds. And very much the point of the, um, the Satipatthana Sutta, the four foundations or four focuses of mindfulness, is the refrain. This is the insight refrain that comes with it. That's the purpose of of the uh, of mindfulness in this context. And I'll read what Ajahn Brahm has said. It's a bit different from the one the translation you're used to, but it's actually very good. I think it's very easy to understand in English. You don't need any um, technical knowledge, actually, where some of the other translations you need a little bit more. So this is his translation of the refrain. In the Satipatthana Sutta, in the uh, Four Focuses of Mindfulness, the Buddha's talking about four areas that we focus on. And this is the body, the feelings, or as Ajahn Brahm calls it, experience, and it's also the mind and the mind objects, or principles too, sometimes they call it principles. Those four areas. And in there are a number of exercises with each area. With the body, of course, the most famous uh, area is the breathing, mindfulness of the breathing. But there's also other ones that are very relevant to us, mindfulness of activities. This is our daily activities, whenever we're doing everything. And it's so, so um, you know, indicative or so uh, typical of the Buddha that he includes all the daily activities like drinking, eating, going to the toilet, 
sleeping, everything, you know. So he's really pointing to the fact that mindfulness is not just for when we go, go and sit meditation or walk meditation. It's for the whole day. And of course the other famous one uh, meditation subject in, that, in the Satipatthana Sutta is of course the postures as well, lying, standing or walking and being aware of those postures. And of course, as I mentioned before, a big part of the focus, uh, we'll get into that in a minute with the insight, is that all these things are happening, but there's not a self that is running it, not a me that's running it, an I that's running the show. And there are other exercises in the, uh, the, uh, um, the focus of the body, concerning the body. Some of them are about the unattractiveness of the body. Some are about seeing the body breaking down. Uh, it's called cemetery contemplation, seeing the body after death decay. And uh, they're also seeing the body in terms of elements, different elements of the body. So that is, that's one of the very important uh, focuses of mindfulness. And this is, as I said, the breath me meditation that we will, many people will know. That's part of the body because the breath is part of the body. And then there are feelings, and this is, in English we say the word feelings, but it's not quite, not quite a good translation because it's talking about the pleasant or the unpleasant or neutral quality of our experience, every experience. So Ajahn Brahm is now using this word experience, but the more common term used that people know is feeling, Vedana. And this is a very important contemplation because in a very real way, Vedana runs our lives. Everything, nearly everything we do is going toward finding pleasant experience, avoiding unpleasant experience at all cost. And this drives our lives and, and keeps us in bondage, as it were, because we're always going between the extremes of chasing after pleasure, trying to avoid the pain and the unpleasant feelings that can come through the mind and through the body. So actually this... Uh, this uh, area of contemplation, contemplation of feeling or uh, experience is very, very important. And a number of, you read in the, the, the suttas, that a number of monks and nuns, this is where they made their breakthrough, where they realized freedom. Because they realized the nature of, fe of, uh, of uh, feeling or experience. And particularly when you see it's not me, it's not mine, it's not myself. That is a radical thing to see. It's just feeling, just pleasant. It's just unpleasant or it's just neutral. That really changes things. But most of the time we think, I'm, you know, I'm experiencing this unpleasant feeling, unpleasant experience. And then we have to do something about it. If it's a pleasant one, we'll run after it and try to get it as much as possible. If it's an unpleasant one. Uh, then we'll try and get away from it. So this gives no freedom to us, actually. This is actually one of the, the big limitations of human experience, but we have to come to that. And then the third area is uh, the contemplation of mind called Chittanapasana. And there are quite a few meditators who use this just to reflect on the qualities that are in the mind. This is not necessarily thinking. It's qualities like there's greed in the mind or there isn't greed. There's anger in the mind or there isn't anger. There's delusion in the mind or there isn't delusion. That's a hard one because delusion is almost invisible. <laughs> a big part of delusion is our sense of self, you know, that I'm running the show, I'm in control of this body and this mind and whatever. And uh, in many other states that occur in the mind. And the last area of contemplation, of course, is called mind objects. It's also Dhamma principles, but it's mind objects in the sense that it covers thinking and perceptions that, we, that arise. And it deals with areas that come up in meditation, uh, some of them come up in meditation quite strongly. Like when we're meditating, we can sometimes have hindrances, we call them. These are blocks to meditation. And this, in this uh, area of contemplation, we are looking at how they arise and how they cease and how they, we can, as it were, um, practice so they don't arise again. That's the aim, actually. And in this, uh, this is more like, um, it's not, it is experience, but it's also looking at our experience in terms of the Dhamma, in terms of hindrances, in terms of the uh, body, mind, uh, five aggregates we call of body and mind. It's also to looking at the sense experiences through the six senses, the mind included, five senses plus mind, 
and looking at the Four Noble Truths and looking at the seven uh, wings to awakening or to enlightenment and those factors that take one to enlightenment. So that's those, they're the four focuses but we were actually uh, addressing what we were t I was talking about is what's it for and this is the refrain that comes with each of the exercises. As I said, there's a number in the body contemplation, 14, and in the uh, feeling uh, uh, contemplation, there's a number the same in uh, Chittanupassana, mind contemplation, and also in Dhammanupassana, this is uh, uh, mind object, contemplation of mind objects. But this is what it says here, this is a translation Ajahn Brahm has given, and of course it's adapted to each of the you have to adapt it to each of the contemplations. So here it's focusing on the body, so maybe thinking of the breath, uh, thinking of the physical activities that I mentioned, thinking of the posture and so on. But also we have to adapt it for feelings, we have to adapt it for the mind, the states of mind that we experience, and mind objects. So this is the refrain, this is what it's for, <laughs> this is what Satipatthana is for. In this way, you are aware of your own body, this is internally, or you are aware that the bodies of others are of the same nature as yours, or you abide aware of the nature of both, your own and other bodies. So this is uh, often expressed as internally or externally. But when you use terms like internally and externally, people think, what are they talking about? <laughs> They're talking inside of the way, you know, it's very hard. So here Ajahn Rama said, your own body and other bodies. This is a very good way of looking at it. This contemplation is very much, especially when we're looking at it in terms of ourself, is more of a meditative exercise for developing calm, developing uh, tranquility in, in the body, especially the breath meditation. It's very calming meditation. And uh, it's also obviously um, aimed at insight too, because you know that, that just as the, my body is like this, my breath is like this, the activities of body that I, I, uh, I have, uh, postures that I have, it's the same for, for other people too, for, the same for both, all of us. And this is a quite an important, important insight goes from our personal experience to universal uh, truth, that's what it's aiming at, universal truth. So that means that truth that we see in our own experience is the same for everyone else. So this is a very important part of the insight practice and also for the development of the spiritual path too because we know that just as I experience things, other people experience it in a similar way and then we can have sensitivity for other people, then we can have empathy, call it, feeling for other people, then we can have compassion for other people. But it also gives rise to the possibility of insight. If we only look at ourselves, if we reduce our focus just to ourselves, then uh, of course we, we may miss the bigger picture, see the universal truth. So that everybody is in the same boat. <laughs> and this is the second part of the uh, refrain, or else, you abide aware of what causes the arising of the body. And here Ajahn Brahm says the four nutrients, I'll mention those in a minute. Or you abide aware that the body will cease when the four nutrients cease. Or you abide contemplating the body's causal nature of both arising and ceasing. So this is looking, isn't it, very much at impermanence, the fact that all our bodies, anybody, <laughs> cannot last, it's just of the nature to break down, it has to break down and that the arising of it is due to uh, four elements and the four, four nutriments, sorry, and the four nutriments uh, the Buddha mentions in another sutta actually, I, I, I just saw it uh, when I was uh, preparing for this talk actually, food is one, contact is another, this is like sense contact through the five senses and the mind, so six, six of them, will, this is will, this is uh, sankhara and uh, attention too. So those four qualities um, give rise to the, to the uh, arising of the body. And when they cease, when those four things cease, when there's <laughs> very obviously if there's no food, yes, the body will cease, it will die for sure. But also if there's no contact and no will and no attention, the Buddha says, then the, the body will cease. And you know uh, when when the uh, body can no longer support itself, then 
these things, the mind will split from the body, depart from the body, consciousness will move on as it were, or moment by moment will move on, then these things, contact, will and attention will go. And anybody that's seen a dead body, you know, I can still remember seeing my father and uh, my one of my best friends actually going to the uh, the funeral parlour, touching the body, and you and you, when you really touch the body, you feel it cold. Admittedly, it's been in a fridge, but it's cold, and you just think, "Wow, that's not them." <laughs> so these other, you know, these other uh, nutrients for for life have gone. It's a very, very, it's a very good good contemplation actually. I think anybody that's seen a dead body knows that's not the person they knew. It's just this is just material things, you know, material substance left. So that's, a, that's so uh, we see the causes for the arising of the body and we see that the body ceases to, and we abide contemplating the body's causal nature of both arising and ceasing. When we do that, then we get the insight into impermanence, into what we call a Nietzsche. And so this is a very important um, insight in Buddhism because when we do see that everything is impermanent, we, we, the experience, are impermanent. All the things that we maybe desire are impermanent. It can reduce craving, this, this desire, this wanting enormously. Because if you see something and uh, you have a lot of desire for it, but even if you reflect and you can see it broken down, getting decaying, uh, breaking down, desire can immediately evaporate, actually. It's, it can sober the mind. And this is the nature of insight that it will give us a completely different view of uh, our experience and reduce these defilements of you know wanting desire which promises everything but actually leaves us sort of unsatisfied and continually getting another desire to to try and find fulfillment and satisfaction so that's the second aspect and the third aspect here is or else mindfulness uh, that it is just a body it's just a body, not my body. <laughs> impermanent, it's uh, impermanent, it doesn't last, it's suffering or unsatisfactory. It's not me, it's not mine, and not a soul. This is established in you to the extent necessary for mindfulness and wisdom and essential for liberation. So just that understanding that it's not... Because we take the body, don't we, very much as my body, very much... Um, but really, in in the real sense, the body is a vehicle for us to practice, to live, for the mind to a uh, vehicle for the mind to experience life, to to develop in whatever way uh, we wish or we conditioned actually. So that's the the uh, third part, and this is the the final bit of the. Uh, each refrain with each of these exercises that I mentioned is, and this is lovely, this is really the, 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 the payoff, <laughs> and you abide independent, not clinging to anything in the world. This is lovely. And this is, when you abide independent, means you're no longer, you're no longer uh, dependent, you're no longer addicted, perhaps you could say. That's a strong term, actually. You're no longer, you're, you're free. Independence is another word for free, isn't it? It's just free. And because uh, so many of the, uh, the things in the world, you know, our sense contacts particularly, our sense of self, they keep us bound up. They keep us, uh, as it were, in chains. They keep us, they imprison us, they limit us. And not clinging to anything in the world, this comes from insight. Because the, the purpose of insight is to realize that there isn't anything worth clinging to, you know, that it is of the nature to pass away. It is, it can never, whatever we want, can never fully satisfy. And in the end, it's not a self. So I don't know if you, this is, this is the not clinging to anything in the world. And some people may think, wow, that's a bit, that's a bit dismal. <laughs> they may think that actually, but actually, Somebody who, who realizes this is actually incredibly happy and incredibly free because our minds are not free. We, we are caught up in this, uh, this constant, uh, as it were, constant promise of craving, they call it tanha in uh, Pali, that if we, we can get what we want, 
then we'll be happy. But I think everybody's been through that many, many times, whether it's with a new car, new laptop, a new relationship, a new house, whatever it is, or finishing this degree, finishing that degree, or new job. It's, uh, it's never ending and it's never fully sat satisfying. So this is not clinging to anything in the world. And as I mentioned, this, the important thing is to realize this truth within oneself, but of course to apply it universally, include everybody in it. And it has to be, has to be, this understanding has to be our understanding. It's not, it's a direct understanding for us. We have to see it. That's the nature of insight. It's not something we, we believe, because the Buddha said it, we believe it. It's important that uh, we, uh, with the Buddha's teachings, we understand, yes, oh, this is from the Buddha, we must look at this. But it's not enough to believe it. We have to find out for ourselves. We have to directly experience it for ourselves. And in the re recollection of the Dhamma that you chanted, it's got to, to be experienced individually by the wise. And that's us. That's us, to be, in, uh, to be experienced individually. It's not, uh, it's not enough, as, I were, as it were, to rely on the books, to the authority of any teacher. We have to find it out for ourselves. The beauty of the Buddha's teaching is that it shows us where to look, how to look, and mindfulness enables that. And of course, the, the, main, uh, the main ways of developing um, that these insight, insights, are, there's two, two aspects to it, develop tranquility. This is where we calm the mind, where we deepen the uh, focus of mindfulness. It's a very good, very important point to to make. I think that sometimes people think that mindfulness, this is sati, is different from samadhi. That you know, you either do mindfulness or you do samadhi practice. And you often hear that, don't you? You know that, uh, particularly in Burma, the idea that mindfulness is enough. You know, that samadhi is something. You know, it's it's not essential or <laughs> it's not needed or whatever. But really. Mindfulness is the basic ingredient of samadhi, that's it. Mindfulness is aware of the present moment and samadhi is just mindfulness that's got more and more still, more and more in the present moment, more and more focused on a smaller and smaller area so that you can really see deeply, really see powerfully. So we need that samadhi. And of course, you know, the Buddha says the pinnacle, the, 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 uh, for the most Mindfulness we can develop. Where is that? Do people know? Fourth jhana. Fourth jhana. This is very deep meditation. That is the pinnacle. So it's not. It's not that mindfulness is divorced from uh, samadhi. That they're two different, uh, two different beasts, as it were. They are actually the same. They're the same experience, but getting more and more still. So very important that. So tranquility is a very important, that samadhi aspect is very important for developing the power of the mind. And very, very often the Buddha says that from, uh, from samadhi, this is uh, stillness, steadiness, the mind unifying. From that we can see things as they truly are. That's the usual causal relationship that the Buddha expresses. That's how he usually expresses it. So it's very important. And uh, the other aspect, of course, and you can see this with the Satipatthana Sutta, is, is developing insight. And of course, once the mind is empowered through samadhi, through it, mind unifying, coming together, then it can really develop deep insights into things. And uh, Ajahn Brahm gives very nice examples of that. You know, like if you look at a leaf, Normally, with our ordinary mind, we look at a leaf and think, well, it's, you know, it's green, or <laughs> it's this type of leaf or that type of leaf. But samadhi, the, when the mind is unified, it can look into it in such, such detail and see so much more into it. And that, that experience, that uh, data, as it were, then gives us a lot of potential for insight. But usually our, our ability to see into things, penetrate things, is somewhat reduced. So mindfulness helps us and then when it becomes deeper and deeper, it becomes samadhi and then it uh, can give rise to this insight. But very obviously, you know, if we're practicing uh, mindfulness in daily life, we're, we're breathing, all of us are breathing in daily life, I hope. <laughs> and if we're doing these activities and postures and so on, then mindfulness is possible and then insight is also possible from these experiences. Maybe not at that time, but later as well. 
Because if the mindfulness is continuous, and this is the aim of, of uh, meditation actually, to make it continuous so we're aware moment to moment, then this, this, these insights into the body, into feelings or experience, into the mind and to mind objects can come up at uh, any time. And the important thing for mindfulness, as I say, is not only that it gives us the information, the data that we can use for insight, but it gets us off automatic pilot too. <laughs> That's what I call it, automatic pilot, where we, we are caught up in you know, the, our, our habits, the habit patterns we have, and the thinking that supports that. Being in the present moment, having the context of the Buddha's teaching, uh, helps us to get out of the, this automatic pilot and very, in a very real sense, to have choice there. Because a lot of the time, you know, we don't have so much choice because it's very conditioned by what we've, the habits we've established in the past. So it's very, very useful from that point of view. And one of the great benefits of mindfulness in, in this area is that we can see things rather than be them, you know, because often, particularly with uh, difficult emotions, or uh, particularly... Difficult emotions, maybe we're upset. If we can see it, just that fact that we're looking at it, there is a bit of a gap there already. So we're not 100% experiencing it. We are, as it were, standing back a little bit and getting some understanding about it. And that changes the experience enormously for all of us, whether it be you know, anger, um, you know, depression, anxiety, whatever. If there's that mind state, the mindfulness can be watching that. And this is part of, you'd probably say, of uh, the states of mind, contemplation. If it can see that, then we have a gap. And also that gap allows us some distance in order to, as it were, digest it, to get, get a bigger picture of what we're experiencing and perhaps develop mindfulness. So I might say, and often uh, mindfulness is, is, is thought of as like a mirror that reflects our experience, reflects our mind states too, you know, very much, uh, enables us to understand our experience. So this is going to link into <laughs> a story I was going to tell you, so it's a good time. I think we need a story. Just to finish off, pretty much. And this is from Nasruddin. <laughs> So I often tell these stories from Nazareth. People like them, actually. Though some people sometimes tell me, why don't you use Buddha stories? But I said, I like these. These are very funny, actually. <laughs> That's why I like them. And also, Nazaruddin was a Sufi teacher. They're supposed to have been a real person who lived in Turkey a very long time ago. So some people say maybe he's mythical. But, uh, but anyway, one day, Nazaruddin is walking down a road, and he, find, he sees something in the gutter. He thinks, what's this? And it's sort of shiny, and he goes and picks it up. And it's a, it's a metal mirror. It's a metal mirror. And those, even in uh, time of the Buddha, I think they probably had very polished surfaces to see yourself in. And he picks it up and he looks and he goes, oh, ugh. <laughs> and then he thinks, then he thinks, no wonder they threw it away. <laughs> it's so ugly. <laughs> it's so ugly. It's my fault for picking it up in the first case. <laughs> we, we're often like that, don't we? <laughs> We're not looking in, we're looking out. <laughs> we're blaming others. You know, this is very much the, this is very much the, very good quote. <laughs> That's great, I love that. It's, it's so ugly. No wonder they threw it away. <laughs> it's his fault for picking it up. <laughs> And that's, that's very true that we often blame. We're looking outside and we don't, we don't realise that it's us. <laughs> and that, uh, this, is, this is where we need to, to focus, actually. This, this is where we need to reflect. So, so very good. So uh, I'd just like to finish off, actually, uh, a little bit with just saying that mindfulness, of course, in daily life we need it, absolutely. I think uh, you know, it helps us live our lives in the most skillful way possible. And also certainly to keep the precepts, you know, keep the ethical behaviour of, of body and speech is very helpful. And also to get some understanding, as we were talking about in the contemplation of the body, of the activities, you know, the movements of the body, the things we do, all of them. And also uh, it gives us an understanding of the postures and so on. So very useful in ordinary life. In meditation, of course, it can become much, much deeper. The mindfulness can become very, very... Um, powerful, more powerful. And of course in jhana, as I mentioned, fourth jhana, it becomes superpower. 
Sojourn Brahm uses this, this sort of terminology, actually, ordinary mindfulness, power mindfulness, and superpower mindfulness. And of course, you know, if people are in any doubt about superpower mindfulness, this is the fourth jhana. This is where the Buddha came enlightened after fourth jhana, it was after that. The superpower mindfulness of fourth jhana allowed him to have these insights that led to him awakening, becoming a fully enlightened Buddha. So it's a very, uh, it's it's a very important thing for breaking through. So I think I think that's probably enough for today. I was just going to mention that to encourage all of us, myself included, to develop more mindfulness in daily life, in in the meditation, uh, in, wherever we can. The Buddha said uh, we cannot have too much mindfulness. There's no worry about that. <laughs> some things and some qualities, mental qualities, he talks about need balance. And he does mention some that need balance. So for instance, faith and wisdom, uh, he said, needed balancing. And energy and uh, um, samadhi or the mind unifying, they need balance. But for, for uh, sati, for mindfulness, he said we can never have, a, have enough. So, and also, as I've mentioned very before, sati, this mindfulness, gives us a choice in life too. We're not so much conditioned by our habits, by the way we've thought and spoke and the way we've uh, um, done things before. It can give us that ability to see things differently and bring, bring about change. So I hope you find, have found this uh, talk um, useful and that we can all develop more mindfulness. And when we have more mindfulness, we'll be much more sensitive of other people, ourselves and other people, actually. And often Ajahn Brahm says mindfulness also has a sense of kindness in it. So if you hear kindfulness, that's a nice term. <laughs> so I'd like to finish there and thank you very much for listening today. And I hope the man who had the uh, attack is better now and... Uh, and that was a very good teaching for all of us, you know, uh, not, not only about mindfulness but about life and about illness. Old age, sickness and death are insight practices and uh, they will happen, they happen to all of us. So it's very good to have reminders and this was certainly a reminder for all of us. All right, so I thank you very much for your attention today.